Wisdom. Prudentia. Justice. Justicia. Temperance. Temperantia. Courage. Fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. This week's guest is Peter Stankiewicz, the author of Manual of Reform Stoicism. If you are interested in this book by Vernon Press, you can go to their website, vernonpress.com, that's V-E-R-N-O-N press dot com slash books. If you use the promo code SUNSP30, S-U-N-S-P-30 on checkout, you can save 30% off the book's cost and get free shipping. Today's guest is Dr. Peter Stankovich. Peter is a philosopher, member of the Modern Stoicism team, teacher, and author. His works include Does Happiness Write Blank Pages on Stoicism and Artistic Creativity and the Manual of Reformed Stoicism. Peter, Dobry Dan, welcome to the Sunday Stoic. Dobry Dan, yes, good. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Good to hear you. How are things in Poland? Uh, developing rapidly, uh, changing all the time. I mean, it's a kind of a situation that you, you know, the, uh, you would have the prime minister throwing a, a press conference, conference like twice a day and the, the, the update, I mean, the, the pandemic, the, the coronavirus, of course, is like changing constantly. But, uh, I, I guess we are, uh, we are good for now. I mean, there is no, there is no major like wave of you know deaths and uh, and people dying in the street or something. We're, I, I think it's uh, the lockdown came lockdown came came in pretty early, so I think we're hoping for the for the best here. But yeah, the uh, question of uh, the uh, pandemic and stoicism obviously obviously is a is an important one and an obvious one to ask. Yeah. And how is the situation uh, at your place? Well, uh, people are not doing a great job of social distancing, as they call it. Uh, there are still some crowds here and there, uh, but the, the, the university is mostly shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm teaching online, and obviously. the stores have most of everything you need, but there are obvious bare spots on the shelves where uh, I saw a few people pushing carts with five or six cases of toilet paper which obviously they don't need i i don't understand this phenomenon but uh... toilet paper became a bit of a thing right i mean i didn't really understand why toilet i mean what what why toilet paper and not like sugar or canned <laughs> food or whatever toilet paper kind of it just gained, gained momentum on its own right you can't eat it uh so <laughs> i don't know it's it's a strange thing strange very strange um, before we jump into your newest work, why don't you tell everyone a bit about yourself, um, who you are, what you do, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a philosopher and an author. That's the best characterization I, I can say. I write books in English and in Polish, my, uh, my mother tongue. Uh, and for, for the philosophical part and for the English books, it's mostly concerned with stoicism. Uh, there are two books out al already by about stoicism, my books, and the basic idea is that I'm trying to kind of develop the idea that stoicism can, the philosophy of uh, of the Stoics can be useful and relevant and valid today, not just as a, an object of study, but as a uh, you know project of living an actual life for a person like me, like like you, like anyone else. And the big, so obviously, uh, the pandemic situation with the coronavirus just is a reminder that, uh, yeah, that we can definitely benefit from that uh, and that it is always useful. Uh, the, the big question here, but I was, uh, uh, I was supposed to introduce myself. So, yeah, I do. I write, th I write books. I write, uh, I write in the press um, uh, on both online and, uh, and traditional papers here in Poland. Uh, I teach at a university also. Uh, that kind of stuff. That that would be the um, the good uh, introduction, I think. And, and yeah, I'm, the, I'm a member of the uh, Modern Stoicism team. It's a kind of a loose network of people all over the, uh, all over the world who are kind of into Stoicism and, try, and they are trying to, and who try to, you know, do things like uh, 
they put together the Stoicon annual event, the Stoic Week, the online course, the blog Stoic Today, just modernstoicism.com is the landing page for this. And so I'm a, I'm a member of the team, but also I do have uh, some of my own ideas about what Stoicism should look like. And I, you know, I'm trying to uh, propound them in my, uh, in my books. And uh, but getting back to Stoicism, the big question is, so it, we can, it's an established fact, I guess, that uh, stoicism can be useful today. The big question is how, what stoicism? I mean, uh, I believe that we cannot take just Marcus Aurelius and, ancient, and the ancient stoics and use them verbatim. We, we need to, uh, you know, uh, transform, we need to adapt, we need to, or as I, as I prefer to use it, uh, to call it, uh, we need to reform stoicism so that it is relevant and uh, factual and valid today. And my, my latest proposal how to do that is uh, the manual. Oh, you got it. Yes. I got a Perfect. copy. Manual, manual, for, uh, manual of reform stoicism. Uh, so, yeah, that would be the basic outline, I think. So stoicism obviously lasted a while and then kind of sort of disappeared <laughs> uh we and, in a way and it's popped up here and there uh but now it's coming back in a big way so it has not had a chance to catch up and evolve for uh the last thousand years or so uh, you probably know the numbers better than i i'd have to think about it yes but um yeah so let me ask you then what is reformed stoicism can you in a nutshell define that uh, in a nutshell, oh, well, or uh, or for our podcast, that's up to you. So, so uh, to begin with, uh, I think it's just what you. I mean the the um, the framework is exactly as you described it. The idea is that so many things have changed over the last two millennia since Marcus Aurelius died. Like that's basically eighteen hundred years. Uh, that we need to, as you said, catch up. We need to catch. We as as the Stoics in the 21st century, we need to catch up on all the developments in philosophy, in science, presumably uh, first and foremost, in, uh, in, uh, in social stuff, in politics, and so on, and so on, and so on. We cannot be Stoics, if, uh, we cannot be Stoics neglecting all that, because Stoicism is factual. Stoicism, in Stoicism, we accept the facts about the world, and we kind of build on them we uh the our, our input data is the factual truth about the world and if you want factual truth about the world we cannot neglect all the things that we know in the 21st century science and so on and so on so and so on so that's the framework we need to catch up on the um on the things we have uh, uh missed out uh, on that's the that's the framework and now for reform stoicism uh the idea is that there are certain things that in, in the ancient stoicism that work very well, that are, are kind of timeless, and uh, and I, I elaborate on them in my book. As you probably already know by now, the things, uh, the, 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 this divide of things that are in our power and are not in our power. The idea that we, um, our life and happiness is not defined uh, by facts themselves, but by our narratives about the fact that the story that we wave that we tell ourselves about ourselves about um the world and so on and so on is more important than the facts themselves so certain things are useful and we need to focus on them and certain things are uh, let us say uh less useful and we shouldn't focus on them for example uh, the very big concept and probably the most controversial move here is that I'm not really uh, I'm not really the fan of the the concept of uh following nature which is the Kind of a you know cornerstone of entire stoicism. Right. The, the problem the problem with it is that uh, is that when we say you need to live according in agreement with nature and so on and so on, uh, you don't really say anything. I mean, if you limit yourself to just that catchphrase, uh, that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, in antique and that's the that's the change here in antiquity for Marcus Aurelius, this concept. Was probably kind of self-evident what nature means, what uh, what following nature means. Today, in the twenty-first century, yeah, the, we have a problem. We have very great. Uh, 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 we have many interpretations what that might mean, whether or not whether it means nature in the bio biological sense, Darwinian evolution, and so on and so on. 
whether or not it means say um living in agreement with uh with nature like ecology and you know getting back to nature and so on and so on whether or not it means uh, nature means science, right? I mean, an ag agreement with nature, uh, consistency with nature would mean consistency with science and so on and so on. We have many possible interpretations. So my, the, the, this kind of a move I make is that we need to focus on the specifics, on what, on how we need to live in detail. And this, this, these are those, you know, 26 chapters in the book that I uh, go one by one trying to, you know, uh, trying to, to narrow down on the specifics of what the stoic -like life looks like. And just, you know, embracing the, uh, the banner of following nature, just saying following nature doesn't really solve anything. So that would be the basic, that, was, that would be one of the mistakes. And I can go on and go on and <laughs> go on, but maybe you should, you, should, you know, uh, you should navigate this conversation conversation with some more questions because yeah there sure sure so what i noticed uh, early on is you have a i i think of it as a novel approach although it fits perfectly with what the stoics mm -hmm. say and that's this idea of narratives yes um so uh you mentioned that uh narratives are are the way we interpret the world essentially they're they're the yeah. way the filter by which we experience facts i guess is one way to yeah. i'll let you explain it better than, than i can um so can you explain your use of this term narrative and how it applies to stoicism uh this i think is not that controversial i believe i mean uh the uh my views on nature are a right. bit of a controversy but 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 narrative i mean the thing is that the, the the use of the term itself may sound kind of provocative, maybe right, because we usually talk, you know, a narrative we associate it with like um, with some relativism, with some uh, with uh, with politics, probably like media cycle and and stuff like that. That you know that folks that control the narrative, the the shaping narrative in order to pursue political goals and so on and so on and so on. So. This is kind of a weird context to use that, but I do believe that this word fits perfectly because in Marcus Aurelius, we have, uh, I mean, and it varies from translation to translation, but in the ancient Stoics, we have uh, those, the idea of conceptions, impressions, sense impressions, or however you want to, however you want to call that. And uh, I think that the mo and this is this uh, idea here, that the most precise and most relevant translation of those concepts or conceptions or yeah conceptions that would be in Marcus Aurelius I guess that would go with conception uh is a narrative right it, it because uh, today when we um this is exactly I believe what they the ancient stoics meant the idea that there are certain facts certain you know events in the outside world and then we create something upon them they the ancients called it conceptions today i think the better term is the narrative right the narrative that we constantly from the moment we wake up till we go to bed uh there is this kind of a you know voice in our head that explains tells the things to us and this is basically what they meant i think that this is the most uh that, that that's that, that's the best term a narrative and also this, uh, you know, the, this gives the link to the uh, social, con social and political context, the narratives that, you know, people suggest to us and that may be, you know, to our detriment or to our benefit and so on and so on. That, that's, I think, the, uh, the thing here. And I believe that the choice of the word may sound controversial, but the, actually it is just a very fitting word. And then now for the, for the exact meaning of it, um, when we say, for example, something adverse happens, like let's imagine that in two minutes this Skype link we have a great we're having great conversation. Yeah, exactly. But there is a there is a plugs out situation in in two minutes, and the the screen goes goes black, and uh, we 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 lose it all. If I say that, uh, and so this this would be a fact, right? This is a fact, something that happens, and now. Uh, half a second after that in my head I, I, I have this kind of a choice that uh, I, I may say to myself using this narrative or conception uh, that yeah it's me 
I'm a loser and it always happens to me. I'm not really, you know, that good with technology and doing an interview over Skype is too difficult for me. And it's always like this and so on and so on. And then just it goes downward, down, it, go, it just goes, goes uh, downward from there. And this is a narrative, right? Nothing in the event itself forces me to embrace this particular narrative. So why not embrace another one? Uh, as I call it, a useful narrative, a narrative which is a more, uh, more, uh, more beneficial, more, uh, more positive to us. Like, for example, okay, it crashed. Um, let's say I'll try, I'll try again, or maybe the interview wasn't going that good anyway. So that's <laughs> actually a silver lining or something like that. It is, in a word, it is my decision to um, to choose that narrative. And you're asking what reform, stoic, reform stoicism is. In this context, this is this kind of uh, knowledge that this um, that uh, that I have this freedom be- before between the fact and choosing the narrative. I need to be aware constantly that there is this choice for me, that there is this room for, uh, for interpretation, and I can go with either uh, positive, narrative, useful, beneficial to me, which reinforces me, and so on, or uh, the other one, which is uh, which is deadly for me, and that's the choice that we always uh, face, and that's our responsibility that we we are we are able to respond to facts using a proper uh, narrative. So that's one way to lay out the basics here. So it's up to us then to be on guard as events unfold to watch which narratives we use to interpret them. Yes, right? ex- exactly. And uh, the way um, I would say, uh, I say uh, the, uh, the effort of learning stoicism, at least in my case, speaking personally here, is that it is very... Uh, it is easy. It is kind of easy to have this epiphany that you know, okay, I can choose my own narrative. I can, you know, kind of shape this story that I'm telling myself, and uh, I do that, and okay, I'm happy for like ten minutes, and then I forget it, and and then a week goes by when I'm, you know, uh, depressed and stuff. So uh, the the problem is that it is very easy to sleep uh, to slip out of it, uh, and the uh, the whole effort of learning stoicism, kind of trying to become a better stoic, and so on and so on is that I, I'm trying to constantly remind myself that this choice is always uh, my own, mm-hmm. that I always have this ability to respond in a, in a way that I seem fit. This is the thing here, that I need to be aware of that constantly. And it is very easy to forget that, and that's why we need you know, all, those, all these handbook, handbooks of stoicism. That's why we need to get back to it and you know, read and read and, and, and try again and again. So... Do you have any tips then, not not to make stoicism into a, a hack, of course, but we have a lot of narratives that a lot of us have brought with us f- through our lives. And so they're yes. old, well-ingrained narratives. And now that yes. we're trying to practice stoicism, we might realize that some of those are not useful narratives or yes. false narratives. So what can we do to uproot I know we have that in the book, but what are what are some inputs on uh, some some advice from you on getting rid of those non useful narratives? So first, I mean, uh, it may seem kind of uh, kind of um, weird, but the very realization that I can do that is the hack number one. That I need to realize, and that's basically Marcus Aurelius, right? right? First of all, I need to realize that the fact and my impression or the narrative about the fact. Are not the same. Are two things actually, not just one thing, uh, and it just goes from there uh, because those uh, narratives I want to uproot. They have this, you know, tend. I mean, uh, they, they stick in our heads, right? They are kind of built in a way that you know allows them to be kind of sticky, right? If, if there's this kind of weird black tempting power that I need not only to uh, that I kind of need to suffer, need to you know. Uh, debilitate myself with this with a with a negative narrative with, with some kind of a negative thought, but it, it it also has this kind of rationalization that I need to think that this is the only rational way to put that and so on and so on and so on. So the hack number one is to realize that this is just a narrative, that this is just a thought or a stream of thoughts or a pattern of thought like any else, and then we 
are able to just let it go. That would be this. This is uh, this is the first moment of realization. Uh, besides that, uh, the idea that uh, I think it is important to kind of try on other narratives in a way that even if uh, I am kind of uh, down in the dump, uh, down in the dumps, even if I'm really feeling bad about something. Uh, and this narrative is really this negative narrative, negative thoughts are really sticky. Then just even abstractly trying on just imagining another way to frame that, and that's why we need books for to, to do that for us. Uh, may be very useful. The very realization that there is a w- other way to uh, tell that, to other way to narrate that is it is a it is a it is a way to go. So that would be number number two. On the other hand, uh, turning to my book, Manual of Reformed Stoicism, the thing is that the narratives, only the first two chapters are about narratives. There are 24, I mm-hmm. guess, more chapters, which kind of lay out the specific, the kind of those specific, as you, as you said, hacks for doing that. And this is also a kind of a meta response that I, if I want to get rid of the useless negative narrative, and if I want to embrace something more positive, then I need to pick some some. Uh, particular uh, particular technique, particular uh, hack to deal with uh, with this problem and, and, and to use that, right? So, uh, yeah, that's how it goes. I know you say uh, early on there, let's conduct ourselves as if we had the narratives that we want. So, yeah, exactly. So, so fake it until you make it and <laughs> is one way to... Uh, is, is, or you have narratives that are that are cla- you know get the narrative you want yeah. and it kind of fights with the one that you don't want <laughs> until it takes power it takes control it, i guess it may it may sound funny but it it works i mean at least in my experience sure. i mean I, I you know this individual experience is also always biased but at least in my case this is how it works that uh um there's the saying that you know that uh, dress for the job that you want not right. the for not for the job that you have right so this is kind of a similar thing dress your own mind in the narratives you you, you know or you think would be beneficial positive uh, reinforcing to you and, no, and not uh, do not dress them with the narratives that are just kind of sticking or or laying around and it will work and it it, it does work right and this is uh in my own uh, experience this is this is a this is a good way to go yes so uh one part i uh enjoyed reading also was kind of reflect uh, it helped me to reflect on what's going on right now with the coronavirus and yeah we can use that example that's a perfect example obviously yeah for what one way to look at it is a lot of us are at home more depending on our yes. our jobs and we have work to do but it would be very easy to uh take on useless narratives, as you put it, that would, well, I can watch some Netflix today instead of writing that lecture. Uh, yeah. And then I can do this instead of that. And and uh, you you mentioned that sometimes uh, a, a, a bad narrative might sneak in with, with another one, like a Trojan horse sort of thing, yeah. where, where, where one thing might be correct, but this other one may not be. So... What advice would you have then for for uh, uh, this time when uh, you know this could go a number of ways? But let's just start with I'm at home. Yes. I should be doing work, uh, but I'm tempted to watch Breaking so Bad all, or something. Yeah. Uh, break, yeah, Better Call Saul is there. Better Call Saul. That's actually what I actually have been watching uh, with my wife. Better Call Saul. <laughs> oh, that, that that's very that's very good for you. The guy is not a stoic. Uh, many <laughs> Mike's on the show, I would say. Uh, maybe Mike a bit, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The entire this entire show is not the perfect example. Probably here. not. Getting back to what you said, first of all, this idea of uh, Trojan horse and the bad narrative sneaking into our mind is not my idea. Obviously, it's Seneca's. I believe this is a this is a classic stoic approach. That this we are we never we need to be vigilant, but the the uh, bad impressions, bad narratives will always. Uh, sneak in somehow. So that's why we need to start start over again and again. That's one thing. Uh, for the coronavirus, for the staying at home, uh, I will give you an. Uh, I will kind of uh, do this. Um, I will provide an example for what I said earlier that we need to 
the war, uh, deal with those narratives, not in an abstract way. It's not like I sit down and, you know, just deal with, I have this narrative or that narrative. The thing is to apply a more specific technique. And in this case, this would be chapter, if I recall, well, chapter three and chapter four in my book, the about things that have, I have in my power and things that I do not have in my power. Uh, there are basically very little things that I have fully in my power, under my control, but they are extremely important things. Uh, basically, the values I, I'm trying to uphold in my life, the uh, goals I set up for myself and, and uh, that I'm shooting at, and the, uh, the the direction in which I'm trying uh, to change my character, whether or not I'm trying to be a better or, a, in case of breaking, breaking bad, worse person. <laughs> uh, so basically, the uh, what I do with my character, my values, and my goals, and uh, this this would be a perfect uh, the a perfect narrative to to explain this. Uh, I let's say I do have some goals in my life. I want to do this, this, that, and that. And then the quarantine comes in, the lockdown comes in, and I I, I need to stay at home. So I cannot do. I have this this list of goals, and I cannot do half of them because I shouldn't go outside. So what do I do? I just focus on the other part. I just focus on the goals that I, I can do at home and basically that. And it, this may sound kind of easy or, 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 or something, something too easy or something, something obvious. But the, um, the, the mystery here is that uh, we need to have that list of goals ready and handy, right? That's the point here. If I and this is how the non-stoics live, I, I, I would say uh, that they do not have; they just kind of go about their business in this kind of irregular or haphazard way. Uh, not and they do not have this kind of a more specific list of uh, of goals and values they wanna they wanna tr they they try to uphold. If I do have a proper list, then it is very this is very it would be very unusual. For any event, a, a real disaster would have to happen to kind of, you know, debilitate, kind of to separate me from doing anything from that list. Usually, you always have something on that list that you can do and under any, uh, under any circumstance. Uh, and basically, this is, I guess, now per, speaking personal, this is something I think I see with the coronavirus situation. Many, may, this idea that people... Um, I wrote a. Uh, it's in Polish, so uh, so, so um, you know, not internationally accessible. But just a few days ago, I published a short uh, kind of a piece um, online saying that uh, I do I do not really understand how people you know live in the sense that the uh, apparently the idea of having to stay at home kind of crushes the, all their lives because they have nothing to do. This is something that people say all the time in this or that form that, yeah, we are kind of bored. We don't have anything to do. Maybe let's, 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 let's watch Netflix or let's, uh, let's play board games or whatever you, uh, or whatever you want to do. And it's kind of super, I, mean, I don't want to say kind of stupid, but it's kind of an unusual way of thinking for me because I uh, I always have something to do. This is this is this part of Stoicism that I, I believe I have embraced a, a big while ago that uh, you always need to have a number of things that you want to do and you need to kind of keep them in your uh, in the light of your awareness. You need to really know what you are trying to achieve in your life and then it's really difficult for changing circumstances to deprive you uh, of all of them at once, right? I, I want to write a book. I can write a book whether there is coronavirus or not. I want to, I don't know, I want to practice sport. I can practice sport indoors. I can do push-ups. I can do whatever, right? This is this is this thing. If uh, adversity comes and it, um, it, uh, and if I'm not prepared, if I don't have this list ready, I, I do have a problem then. And, and, and basically this is what I think happens with many people today. So part of that kind of hails back to um, Epictetus talking about determining your roles and what roles you have in life. Um, so I'm a dad. What what am I? What yes. am I? What are my responsibilities? So am I. And uh, if I'm at home, I can do the roles of father. I am a teacher, and my job is to stand in front of a class and teach. But yes. but now I am uh -huh. a I am a teacher who is quarantined. 
my role has changed. <laughs> I, I have a new set of roles that I have, and the other things I cannot do. That's beyond my power, I guess. So, uh, if I can inter, I mean, yeah, that's, no, go a ahead. To, that's, that's a perfect moment to, to say two things. That first of all, uh, that first of all, um, that, that, that the problem of this idea of these roles in life is that they conflict. Yes. If you are a teacher, if you the most basic, most of example, if you're a teacher and you need to, you know, teach and you have to prepare classes and so on and so on, but you also have a, a kid or a baby or a toddler or a newborn at home, these two sets of duties will conflict. And this is a problem, right? This is a problem because you, you, you have really nowhere to define. I mean, there, it's very difficult to. Uh, define whether or not in a given situation the role of a father or of a teacher is more important. There will always be conflict. So that's the problem with this idea of, of roles, right. that there is a, it, it, it won't give you a concrete course of action. There will, unless you are stranded on a desert island, you're just a guy trying to survive, you will always be in a multiplicity of different roles and trying to kind of uh, put them together. So that's uh, that's a problem. Uh, the other thing about yeah, that you are now a, a teacher who is grounded, right? <laughs> right. Uh, in a quarantine, circumstances do change, and it is very uh, important, I believe. Now turning back to the differences between reformed stoicism and ancient stoicism, we need, a, particularly in the modern world. Uh, things do change and the circumstances change and we need to be much more flexible, I think, than what the ancients thought we need to be, right? Uh, a teacher, you, you can you can teach remotely, you can, I don't know, uh, record your uh, your lecture or some, you can do something like that. Uh, but that's actually not that a big change of a circumstance. I mean, uh, things can change more uh, let's take the technology right uh 20 years ago or 30 years ago it would be completely impossible to do this interview europe uh us uh, europe and us online because there was no internet or almost no internet the connection would be possible and so on and so on and so on uh the social kind of a uh, constitution how the entire society works uh, what does it mean to be a teacher? Uh, for example, with the quarantine, it changes all the time. I mean, it changes much more faster than it used to antiquity. So that's again a problem that the just sticking to Epictetus uh, mm -hmm. and his idea of roles that we need to follow, it won't uh, it won't solve much in the in the today's world. And that's why we need to kind of, you know. Uh, Think about, uh, and that's why we need to not just you know simply follow, but constantly rethink stoicism and try to figure out what it means to be a stoic today. Just blindly following the ancients uh, doesn't solve anything. I think. So we're we're sharpening our spears, not just letting them sit there. We <laughs> we we have to hone our tools uh, and and modernize them. Uh, be yeah, that's basic, that's basically my idea. I mean, uh, of course, the the, uh, the title of the book uh, is uh, you know as a title, it's kind of provocative, and this idea of you know reform stoicism. But basically, this is what you are saying that we need to sharpen the thing in order to keep it work. And if it, uh, if the argument from X or something else doesn't work, then we need to get rid of X just to keep the big picture in mind. So yeah, that's exactly. Uh, how it works, and the example with the, those roles of a father and teacher and so on, it's a very good example because it does change uh, a lot. Not to mention that the idea what to uh, what, what does it mean to be a man, for example, changed a lot since the times of ancient Rome. So Absolutely. that's uh, that's obvious. So, uh, so there are some changes on uh, to Stoicism in your view that need to be made. What are some of the Stoic practices that still hold up in your view. Let's say I'm starting day one. I want to investigate Stoicism. I want to set up a way of, of thinking and a way of action that will conform to this philosophy I'm reading. What are some practices that you recommend? 
Uh, the absolute basics is what we have all covered already, I believe. The okay. narratives and facts that, that we that to realize a uh, chapter one. Uh, we need <laughs> to realize one. Okay. that the uh, that the the true content, so to speak, of our life is not the facts and events themselves, but our narratives about them. Then chapter two, uh, we need to yeah, that's uh, that's not accidental. Uh, we need to learn to embrace those narratives that are useful to us, that makes us happier, that makes us stronger, that kind of are good for us and not. Uh, not uh, not the rest, uh, uh, and then the great division, and this is something that is that's I believe timeless. Is it worked during? Uh, it works in Epictetus, and it works for us uh, to to learn how to divide the things that are in our power and the things that are not in our power, right? Uh, and this is of course there is a uh, uh, there is an entire you know string of paradoxes here that because uh, basically the Stoics, as you probably know. As, as the audience probably knows, uh, in Stoicism, only the things that are in our power completely, 100%, are in our power truly. If there is just 1% chance that uh, fate will intervene, uh, it, it is not my in my power at all, and so on and so on and so on. That would be uh, the basics. And for the... Uh, that's the starting point. That's the starting point, I think. But I also think that... Um, in uh, in reform stoicism in the 21st century there is no like um there is no one size fits all kind of approach to stoicism you need to you need to learn the basics but then you need, you you need to independently uh, go on on your own i mean uh, it's not a dogmatic there, religion with a pope at the head that's commanding you to yeah, do a certain thing yeah it has thing. never it has never been just for the record even ancient stoicism was kind of you know conflicted interpretations you know people were not able to agree on basic definition and so on and so on so it was actually the epicureans that had you know epicurus and then just the dogma uh the, the set of dogmas and so on uh, stoicism never has never been a monolithic monolithic church it has always been evolving many Currents often, uh, often uh, conflict and contradict, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's the uh, characteristic of our school that has been around since, you know, since the beginning. Uh, but today, it is very important, I think, to underscore that uh, there is there is personal autonomy, not only in how we live our lives, uh, which is true, but it is also true that there is autonomy in how we choose to. Um, how we choose to be stoics, right? There is, for some guy, it will be more important to follow these stoic ideas, and for another person, maybe someone likes the ideas, uh, the idea about the role that uh, we, the, the roles that we are uh, following in life. What you mentioned in Epictetus, maybe someone else may prefer a different part of doctrine. And there is no telling. There is no. Uh, there is no universal kind of uh, thing here. So. We need to, you know, start with the basics and then uh, dive in on our own. Sure. One thing I like about Stoicism is it is cosmopolitan in nature. Uh, yeah. You can yeah. have the uh, the atheist Stoic and the the Muslim or the Christian Stoic, and they still have some overlap in some of their values, and we can all talk Stoicism and not smack each other down necessarily. We have some common yeah. ground at that point. Yes, absolutely. I, I as I as I said. I don't really like the idea of uh, you know following nature. Sure. That principle is kind of obscure for me. Uh, but the idea of cosmopolitanism, yes, absolutely. That um, you know uh, all all people are you know created equal. That uh, that idea has this. Um, uh, I don't want to say that it comes from Stoicism, but there is you, you can trace it back all the way to to Stoicism and the idea that uh, you know. And Stoic, according to Stoicism, uh, we are all equal as humans because we all share in this divine logos, this divine, right. uh, um, you know, this divine substance that is present in all of us, and this you know divine spark of reason, and so on, and so on, and so on. And again, the ancient Stoics believed that um, for them it was a metaphysical situation. They kind of believed that it is actually this. Logos that pervades the entire universe and is kind of most present in humans in human reason because we're rational and so on and so on. Uh, today, 
uh, the kind of a factual stuff here is less important. I mean, this idea of uh, an actual substance, an actual thing that is permitted in the entire universe is less relevant. What is, what is more relevant is the interpretation of it as a philosophy of cosmopolitanism and egalitarianism, right? That mm -hmm. we are, it follows from there that we are equal, that we have the same rights and so on and so on and so on. And this is a very relevant meaning. Uh, this is very relevant and important today. So, yeah. One thing that uh, I was wondering if we could comment on, since it is, what's yeah. it, we've mentioned coronavirus, and it's the big thing right now when this is being yeah. recorded. Um, you comment on this in chapter one or two. I just got the book uh, the other day, so I haven't progressed terribly far. But I, I don't believe I, I comment on coronavirus because uh, no, no, it's not the book's not that new. But uh, you talk uh, about I think Seneca writes about this, but awaiting the inevitable and fearing the possible. So you talk about someone on death row who knows they're going to die tomorrow. Uh, and would they sleep well that night? As well as someone just having vague fears about the future. Uh, interfering with their lives. So right now we have things that we 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 have unknown an unknown future that we can torture ourselves with. Yes. And there are some probable things in our future. Yes. Uh, that we may want to deal with. And I just wondered if you could uh, tie that into what we've been talking about a little bit. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, one of the <clears throat> I'm trying. I, I'm I'm sort of you know disrespectful towards the idea of following nature sure. but one of the uh, possible interpretation of what following nature means is that we need to follow reason that we as rational beings need to do things that are in concordance with our uh, you know uh, faculty of reason and it, it this one plays good here I mean that is our response to the coronavirus situation should be rational. That is, we shouldn't dismiss that as a kind of a vague fear because it's not that vague. It's unfortunately, it's very real. So we shouldn't dismiss that. We shouldn't be, you know, make fun of people who are really scared and so right. on and so on. Uh, but also we need to not overreact. So this would be the thing, right? That uh, stoicism, uh, and uh, kind of paradoxical because stoicism is famous for, you know, those extremes, right? That, you know, you need to be extremely... Uh, extremely resilient and so on and so on. And it's actually the uh, Aristotelian philosophy that is kind of, you know, associated with the golden mean and so on. But here I believe it's kind of well plays out that reason uh, enables and prompts us to, you know, follow this reasonable path between the two extremes of like over fear and, and panic and overreaction and, and kind of neglection. And so rational uh, response for a stoic, I believe, would be to do what the, you know, authorities um ask you to do to you know do the basic uh stuff basically take the basic precautions and so on and so on but if you want to i mean there are people who cancel uh events like for one year in advance like for for fall 2020 <laughs> and that's crazy for me that that's overreacting. we need to to wait and see how it plays out before we cancel something which is planned for uh like six months from now if I already I, bought I, my tickets for Stoicon, so I'm hoping it doesn't get canceled. For Toronto, for <laughs> yeah. October. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a possibility. We might we might meet there uh, in person. So yeah, that's a that's a good uh, that's a that's a good example. I, I assume Stoicon, which is uh due in October. Uh, yeah, October some, yeah, sometime October. October. Uh it won't be I mean, I guess it shouldn't be cancelled. That would be a non stoic thing. I mean today it shouldn't right. be cancelled right. six months in advance. Uh, but I myself had to cancel some workshops and classes here and there, which were planned for March, which is a rational thing to do at this point, and this is something that people expect. Uh, but you know, reasonable path, and you know, trying to stay, uh, trying to stay uh, cool, trying to str trying to stick to reason, right? Mm -hmm. To 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 you know, to calculate your response, to be. Uh, reasonable in what we are trying to do, which is which, which is kind of a you know timeless advance. This a timeless advice we, we we should follow it always. But in this situation today with, with the coronavirus, it's kind of very easy to. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a good example because we, we we do see both extremes. We do see people who do nothing and just go about their lives as if uh, nothing was happening, and also uh, you know 
toilet paper hoarding and this kind of stuff. Right. We see people who do that too. So yeah, we, we I, I guess you may want to buy like, I don't know, five uh, rolls of toilet paper, five more than you would usually buy, but not 500 <laughs> uh, more, right? That's the, that's the thing. So, so, so yeah, this kind of, this, um, this coronavirus situation, I believe, is a good kind of a lab for uh, for for we, we can observe how you know rational elements and irrational elements kind of go together uh, in human minds, and uh, we as aspiring stoics, we should you know balance that. In a, I mean, we should you know stick to the rational part. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, before we go, I was going to ask you. Uh, Something that comes up often is what it what it means to practice a philosophy of stoicism rather than just uh, have several life hacks that you use to get by that are stoic in origin, mm-hmm. but doing that may not be the same okay. thing as living a philosophy. I wanted to hear your comments on that idea because what we're trying to do is 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 uh, live by a philosophy rather than just use it as a hack to get through a certain difficult situation. I was wondering if you could give your input on that idea. Oh, that's a good question. That's a fair question because I, I, to be honest, I, I believe that, uh, yeah, that that's a bit of a problem of, uh, with my, with, um, that's a bit of a problem <clears throat> because yes, one may sound, uh, what one may say with some uh, arguments to that, uh, that, uh, this approach that you're discussing here is kind of a, just a you know a, a set of life hacks that you need to apply, and that's that's sound criticism. There is a bit of a that there is a problem here. If we you know, you know once we dismiss all those great metaphysical claims about uh, how the world works and such, and this is not something that I do. This is something that already Marcus Aurelius was you know uh, wondering whether or not it's you know chaos or organized cosmos and so on and so on. Uh, so, yeah, well-versed in, in the Stoic tradition. Uh, but once we dismiss all that and once we focus on this, you know, mind hacks that we, we, we've been talking about for the past hour, yeah, one of the lines for criticism, just for the sake of honesty, is to say that uh, we reduce, we strip Stoicism down too much and it becomes a, a set of uh, those life hacks that you can, you know, just apply uh, my response to that would be probably that uh, um, that it's actually much, much more uh, that yeah it may uh, it may seem that way but uh, it is kind of much more coherent than you would um, than you would expect. It's not that just a random life hack here or there. Uh, it's a very it's actually still very coherent body of uh, of those life hacks mm-hmm, so to speak then. And uh, if you practice that, this kind of adds up to a, you know, consistent attitude, a certain way of conduct and way of thinking that uh, is something more, I believe, than just, you know, those life hacks, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, on the other hand, it is true that sci- modern science, psychology and so on, uh, it backs up stoicism a lot. So we are not, you know, just doing, you know, ran, it's not random advice from the internet, but it's, you know, there is a serious scientific backing for that. Uh, the, and another point is that we need to, you know, we need to do that uh, consistently, I mean, over time. Uh, it's not just, just say, you know, today I'm a star because there is coronavirus and tomorrow I forgot and go about my life in a Epicurean way or whatever. It's a long-term project. It's kind of reshaping your uh, character. So it's, it's also something deeper than just, just a life hack. What I said before, uh, there is very little things that we have complete control over, basically our values, our goals, and the way that we try to develop or, 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 or transform our character. And this character thing, who we are, the way that we, are, we may not control it fully, but we can at least control the direction which we are trying to evolve. This is something deeper, I believe, than just you know life hack. Is there anything else you'd and like? I, I, I'm fully, I'm fully aware that not everyone would be convinced by that sure. because I said before, this is a, this is a good line for criticism. Yes. Okay. Uh, Peter, is there anything else you want to mention? 
before we uh, close down the show? Oh, uh, stay cool. Do not uh, do not contract coronavirus. Uh, keep stoic and uh, and carry on. Yeah, more seriously. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's no a, it was a very nice very nice conversation, and I'm uh, totally looking forward to meeting you uh, in Toronto. If that uh, if I, fate, per- I, I guess if fate permits, uh, I certainly will. Uh, yeah. And uh, so manual for uh, manual of reform stoicism, and th- there is also the other book I wrote. Uh, it's called uh, uh, it's called Does uh, Does Happiness Write Blank Pages? Is on uh, stoicism and artistic creativity, and it's, it's a more critical approach it's in this in the way that uh, in that the, in the other book I'm trying to consider the idea whether or not a full fledged stoic can also be a full fledged creative person, an artist, and okay. there. Are, there's a number of uh, very interesting uh, philosophical deep uh, contradictions and problems in there. So mm. if you are for advanced readers in stoicism, uh, I encourage you to, to follow that also. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you very much for a nice conversation. Uh, and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, Thanks for joining the show. And uh, listeners, uh, I will put a code in the show description where I believe you can save 30% on the book if you order it uh, using that yeah. code. Yeah, it's for the promotional stuff. There will be uh, the paperback later on. I mean, uh, in a, a later in, today, in 2020, there will be paperback uh, much cheaper. So, yeah, think about that also. That's great. Peter, thank you so much for joining the Sunday Stoic. Yeah. And uh, I hope to talk to you soon. Yes, absolutely. Carpe diem. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of The Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. <laughs> <laughs>